Our next guest is the Honorable Dr. Will Roper. Dr. Roper is the founder and CEO of the technology startup Is Terry. He is also a member of the Pentagon's Defense Innovation Board and previously served as Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Air Force and Space Force. I was able to speak with him earlier today. Take a listen. Dr. Roper, thanks for joining us. Bob, my pleasure. Thank you so much for, uh, for asking me to talk about the future of national security. Well, let, let's start with uh, Istari. Tell us what you're doing on, on first engineering, metaverse, and what all that means to our vast audience. I'm not a defense expert, but if you can describe it in a way that, that all friends and family would understand. Sure. There, there's there been a trend I've been following since my Air Force days called digital engineering or digital transformation. And, and what it is, is, is being able to create technology completely digitally because models and simulations are now so good that for many systems, they can be treated as a substitute for reality. And Formula One racing does this every year. Every team is digitally engineering its cars to be able to dominate the racing season. Well, that technology is now leaving Formula One and coming into other industries like, like aerospace can build those systems the same way. And so I had a blast learning from teams like McLaren when I served as the acquisition exec for the Air Force and Space Force. Their techniques worked for airplanes and missiles, and, and I think it would work for satellites as well. But since leaving the Air Force, what I've realized is that there is, there's one problem that's really holding back digital transformation broadly. And that's that to do it, you've got to integrate all of your models and simulations together because no one single model or simulation represents a complex system on its own. It's spread across multiple different model types from the structure to the environment to the performance. Even the regulation and requirements are all captured in different models. And you have to make one ecosystem that's consistent with each other. And that's a challenge. It took lots of engineers in the Air Force to do that for me. Um, we had them. That was a great resource that the Air Force and Space Force had. But, but outside of it and outside of large aerospace and defense companies, um, a lot of businesses don't have that engineering bench to do it. And so I ended up deciding to start a company called Astari, backed by Eric Schmidt, to tackle the problem of making model and simulation integration as easy as applications are on your phone. And what this technology, where do you see it? Where, where's the potential in the short and long term? I think you can see a hint of it in how software is developed today. You and I, with no coding skills, could start a software company today and get applications deployed likely on the same day we founded the company. There's so much automation that's in a software development stack today that the abstraction of the code from the application has allowed software to become ubiquitous and accessible by everyone. Now, what I think will happen in future and hopefully will accelerate it in a story is that hardware will be the same way you will be able to create it as easily as you do software because we'll have effectively turned the hardware into software via models and simulations that are connected together that represent the structure or the physics, things that you currently can't access on the internet today. So I think it's an incredible time to be an engineer or a manager in cyber physical systems because they're going to be as agile and adaptable and as upgradable as software has been. And if that sounds science fiction or like something out of the Matrix movies, you see it in Formula One racing every race. Teams are creating thousands of digital twins of race cars, all optimized for different race day conditions that could occur. They're all equally real to the racing team. But the one that's the best fit for the specific race day conditions gets promoted to the physical world, printed in the physical world. And it's the best optimized car that could have been available prior. Well, that concept, I think, will go everywhere. And the power of it 
for military applications is obvious. Having every conceivable design on the shelf ready to go, and when national security demands demand it, you go to print, and you're printing the one that is the best fit for the circumstances. And like Formula One, you don't just print and be done, you instrument the physical twin, feed data back to those models and sims so that you can keep upgrading and improving and not have to be a static target. And over the course of a Formula One season, the car will change over 85%. The car that finishes the racing season is nothing like the car that began. And the car that began wouldn't even qualify for the last race. So that is software-like agility for hardware. And imagine if we applied it to things like drones or aircraft or satellites or uh, uncrewed surface vessels or uncrewed ground vehicles for the army. The power of it is that you keep improving. And from a defensive standpoint, you're never a static target for cyber attacks because your system is always changing. So I think it's the big thing. It's the big thing for our generation that will change the landscape of national security. It's not as much technologies that win on the battlefield themselves, though they matter. It's changing the entire process by which we create those battlefield winners. It's the engine for future war fighting that is the battle to be won. And I think that it's a great trend for the U.S. and its allies and partners, because this is not an industrial revolution that can be undercut by cheap labor the way the last one was. As far as change, uh, some people like change, uh, some people do not. Uh, are there risks involved and, and what are they that policymakers have to identify? Of course, you know, their problems never go away. They just change form. So we, we hope as humanity, we're just changing problems into better and better problems for the future. The biggest issue that policymakers and decision makers in general will have to wrap their head around is when to trust their models and simulations as true authoritative virtualizations for specific functions. And just because you've got a model and simulation doesn't mean it's a substitute for reality. There is a hard calculus that has to be looked at for what error terms are calculated or captured accurately. And so for, for one scenario, you might choose to trust a model or some for another one you you won't and if you if you're wrong then the consequences could be catastrophic so just like with acquisitions or developments today there will be key risk there will be key failures but what's exciting about this new problem space that we're moving into is that many of those failures will occur at digital speed you can learn and adapt and get back on your feet faster than you could if you're relying on physical prototyping and testing as your only way to get feedback. It's expensive, it's slow, and it's environmentally impactful. So collapsing that down into a few minutes time is such a powerful concept. It's hard to even predict how big it will be. Will, will be on the national security landscape. But I've watched Formula One teams redesign a car, retest and recertify in three minutes. Hmm. That's their feedback loop. So I can't wait till that's common in aerospace and defense. How, do, how does the US compare to other countries in this space? <clears throat> well, the good news is Formula One is ahead of everyone. So you can you can feel overwhelmed when you see how far uh, they've advanced uh, the tradecraft for digital testing and digital certification. I certainly felt like we were at the very beginning of a very long journey when I was the acquisition exec for the Air Force. The good news is, is that some of the, the, the techniques that have been applied inside of US defense are actually leading in a world standpoint, I've helped quite a few companies outside of defense to apply some of the techniques that worked for us inside of the Air Force. So that's great. The military is not significantly behind for once. And Formula One provides a guiding star that we can follow. So that's really great news. Now, here's the downside. There's, there's only a few dozen, maybe four dozen companies 
that are touted as as like shining stars, as as lighthouses for these industry 4.0 practices. Many of them are in China. So what Formula One does is on display for everyone. The potency of those techniques is obvious. And so if the U.S. doesn't move with urgency to, to set the conditions, the standards by which technology will be made in future, it may find itself forced into those that have been created in China. So this is an area of great urgency. If there was one wish that I could have for our country, it would be to lead this next transformation of how technology is created. Because if we if we lead this transformation, it's not a transformation that's in isolation. It transforms all of the industries around it, right? What a powerful concept. And you can kind of, if you look back uh, over history, it's technologies that change how you make other technologies that are often the most impactful. They're the exponential curves. We've seen it and are seeing it right now with, with tools like generative AI. It's starting to change how we make other technologies. Mm -hmm. This is now bringing that same kind of exponential curve into hardware so that in future, you're a developer. You're not a software developer. You're not a hardware developer. You're a digital developer. And your system today may be one that needs those models and simulations to access the physical world in digital form. But the next system may be something that's in the pure software sphere and back and forth. So it's a really, it's a really exciting time where things are converging. And when I speak to students on this and they say, what kind of engineering should I go do to be good at this? Anyone you want. Everyone's going to be a digital engineer in future. So you'll still you'll still focus where you're passionate, electrical, mechanical systems. But what'll be awesome in future is you'll be able to explore parts of engineering design outside of your discipline and do it safely. And that's just gonna make problem solving and you know, creating things just, just a, you know, more, more impactful, a little more like Tony Stark in his workshop. You know, he's, a, he's a one man army creating technology like a Fortune 500 company, but how does he do it? Well, if he's creating things, all of the models and simulations he's using to design and look at performance, they automatically connect with each other. And the movies do a great way of imagining how this will be in future with the aid of some pretty snazzy special effects. Well, that, that's not a far future. Connecting those models and simulations together so that we can engineer like Tony Stark, maybe minus the holograms. That's the near future. That's the future I'm trying to help create. It's an exciting future. Uh, we've run out of time. Dr. Roper, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. And just hope everyone's having a great day.